Okay, well, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, so I know that most of you who attend these seminars are probably not seismologists, so I will try to keep the wiggles at a bare minimum. Uh, but I will have to introduce a few seismic concepts all the same, because uh, what we have, what I'm going to present to you today is actually a bit of exotic seismology. So this is not your conventional, um, you know, fire a shot an image or, or do something that's along the lines of well-developed literature. It's really uh, an exercise in treasure hunting. And so um, what, I, what I'll present to you is that uh, Fern and, and Ice present for a very strange medium. And um, it tends to do very strange things to seismic waves in general, and we can use that to our advantage. So, oh, how do I, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, as a seismologist or as a, as a cryospheric seismologist in general, um, there are sort of some, uh, some broad um, challenges in, in, you know, in our science, in our field. Uh, and so, when we think about the goals of, of what we what we do in studying Antarctica and polar other polar climates, um, is that we try to develop sort of robust models that account for feedback mechanisms um, in cryospheric response related to climate forcing, uh, all the while with the idea in mind that we need to separate it from internal variability. So there are baselines to every system that are normal, and we need to be able to split those away from the things that are abnormal. And for the problem with the cryosphere is, of course, it has many uh, feedback mechanisms that exist, and a lot of those are interlinked with each other. And so it's very difficult to separate them from each other. So it's, in, in my experience, it's been very difficult to simply say, well, I'm going to study this ice shelf with, you know, in mind that I'll just understand how this ice shelf works uh, without considering things like ocean forcing or atmospheric forcing or its relationship to the, the flow of the sheet and bed rheology and, and, and essentially all the, the components of these, these models that tend to be very strongly linked. And so when we deal with um, these cryospheric media, oftentimes it requires multidisciplinary studies uh, to even start understanding how these systems work and, and how we can sort of model them um, in order to you know, one day hopefully inform some kind of policy uh, related to, to, um, to our favorite media. So uh, questions for, for people like me is how and where and what scales can seismology help um, constrain some of these problems? And maybe it will let me switch. Oh, good. Okay, so uh, this is essentially the this, this, the sum total of sort of long-term uh, seismic deployments in Antarctica. So this is a figure taken from Andrew Lloyd's paper because he makes nice figures. Um, and so in general, a lot of the, these initial, uh, so the last decade or two deployments have focused on, on sort of continental scale structures. So you have a lot of these really long linear arrays like this. Where essentially, this is pole net here. You have times TAM size and GAM size, which are these two. Uh, you have the Ross D, D RIS array, uh, which were deployed initially in mind with constraining things like uh, the crust and mantle structure beneath the ice. And so um, these sort of are first order parameters that, that, um, that constrain things like heat flux from the crust to the ice sheet, uh, if you have a grounded ice sheet. Um, things like, uh, you know, what the crustal thickness is, what the mantle rheology is like. Um, if there is, if there is, and to what degree is there isostatic rebound from the last ice age? And so these are time scales and structures on, on you know, hundreds to thousands of years that have dynamic variability. Um, but there are also plenty of other seismic studies out there in cryospheric media that have very local sort of targets. So, for example, how do we structurally constrain flow? If you have a flowing ice sheet or an ice shelf, what is the nearby structures? What does the bed structure do to it? Um, things like uh, tidally triggered ice quakes, um, teleseismically triggered ice quakes. Um, and so those are all very local sort of targets. Um, recently, with the advent of, of ambient noise monitoring methods, um, people have started trying to do things like, like ice mass balance um, monitoring. So I'll show you a slide about that in a second. Uh, and so these can have time scales and spatial scales all over the, all over the board. Um, but at the same time, they can permit us to include some small pieces of the greater puzzle. Um, so this is exactly what I was, was talking about in terms of ambient noise methods. Uh, so this is a paper by, by Aurélien Maudret and his group in 2016 that made a bit of a splash. Um, 
And essentially the idea is that it, um, it aimed to monitor the ice mass balance of Greenland because of course there are drastic fluctuations on a seasonal, seasonal time scale. And so, um, so we have these, these, these you know, sparse, the sparse sort of array of seismometers here on the coast uh, of Greenland. And the idea is, is that at low frequencies, the ambient seismic excitation is pretty stable because it occurs uh, on the coast, so the waves on the coast of Greenland. And so when you perform cross-correlation functions of that ambient noise and average it over long time periods, you get these stable correlation functions that you can then um, look for time shifts in. So then those time shifts in the, in the phase of the correlation functions are directly mappable to changes in velocity. And from there, uh, as they observe these very distinct shifts in velocity, this blue dv over v curve here, um, they chose to model it with a, a poor elastic model. So they figured, well, the frequencies are so low that, the that we're primarily actually sensitive to the crust beneath the ice sheet and not the ice sheet itself. And so essentially what happens is that the melting and accumulation of the ice sheet over seasonal cycles uh, causes changes in pore pressure in the crust below. And those are what cause the velocity fluctuations. And so this was kind of a modeling of the crust in order to understand the ice sheet above. And so it was kind of a neat, um, a neat sort of study. But at the same time, the caveat here is that if you wanted to be sensitive to the ice itself, you would have to go to much higher frequencies. And to do that, you would need a stable source of frequency forcing. And that is not something that's very easy to come by in sort of these scales of seismic media. In general, we don't have persistently stable high frequency forcing. So, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is sort of a bit of a subset of all of this. So I came into this, this whole project initially interested in ice shelves and by proxy ice sheets and sort of accidentally wandered into the fern. And the fern is, uh, for, uh, since you're mostly glaciologists, you know more about the fern than I probably do. Um, and so it's this uh, sort of thick coating um, of, of the transition between snow and ice that occurs on the, the top of these cryospheric media. And so it can be anywhere from 50 meters thick to 130 meters thick, depending on where on the continent you are and what sort of processes and forcings are involved. Um, and so this fern has an important role in all of these sorts of feedback mechanisms um, that can dictate whether or not an ice shelf and an ice sheet is stable or unstable. So an ice shelf itself, if we start there, um, can be subject to a whole lot of different forcing mechanisms from sub shelf melting to gravity waves and flow induced weaknesses uh, and fractures. Um, to the calving processes, which is a whole other beast. Um, and part of this is all, you know, the marine ice shelf instability problem is, was actually presented, I, I believe, last week. Um, and so uh, essentially there are a lot of factors that enter whether or not an ice shelf remains stable. Um, and so when an ice shelf becomes unstable and chooses to, you know, or chooses to disintegrate, uh, it'll immediately result in increased ice flocks across the grounding line from the ice sheet. So the ice shelf itself is a bit of a buffer. And so once you have ice sheet instability, then that's when you're really in trouble. And that's when all these catastrophic predictions about global sea level rise and, and so on occur. It's not from the shelf itself, it's from the sheet. But the interesting part to me is what dictates the first step in the, in the ice shelf instability problem. And to study that, uh, I think, for example, we tend to look at pictures like this. Um, and this was a JPL study in 2012. And this is the now very famous overhead satellite picture where this is the collapse of Larsen B, um, which occurred on a time scale of weeks. And so it went from something that looked like a nice shelf to not a nice shelf at all, um, from one satellite pass to another. And so, uh, for our seismic, for, for our community in, in cryospheric science, this actually sparked a bit of an existential crisis. Um, we had always assumed that the scales on which things changed would be smooth and much more predictable um, in terms of, of, of models than what had happened here. And so this panel on the left shows that essentially every ice sheet or almost every small ice sheet on um, in West Antarctica particularly is, is losing mass at a, a very increased rate. Um, one ironic exception is actually the Ross Ice Shelf, which seems to be relatively stable. Um, but essentially, this, this sparked a whole lot of studies, this collapse, um, 
to try to understand how something like this could happen on such a small time scale. Um, and this is actually a study that I, that I quite like from uh, Lil and Danwell in 2019, um, which basically tried to figure out what it would take for, um, for melt ponding to be able to cause widespread hydrofracture and ice shelf collapse. And so that was essentially the suspected culprit in the case of Larson B was that you had extremely rapid surface melting, which caused, um, which caused essentially widespread melt pond formation and then catastrophic hydrofracture. And so uh, this is kind of a neat numerical model that shows that, you know, it's actually quite difficult for an ice shelf to collapse on the scale that we saw with Larson B in this process. It's actually supposed to be quite a bit of a slower uh, situation uh, um, under normal circumstances. And so it really would have required an enormous amount of surface melt uh, on a very short time scale in order to produce what we saw. And for that to happen, we need to first get rid of the fern layer because the fern layer acts as a bit of a buffer. It's, it's a cozy blanket, you know, it, it insulates the, the ice below uh, from phenomena like this. So you have to melt the fern. If you have 50 meters of fern to melt, that can actually take quite a while and it can also dynamically rebound. It just takes, you know, a little time for it to recover from a melting event and then you're okay again. If you have no fern though, as, as shown in this study and obviously by pictures um, by satellite, if you have no fern and melt ponding becomes pervasive, then you have a problem and you lose your ice shelf. And so this picture down here, I, I thought was adequately representative of what happens when you lose your fern layer. This is all, um, this is a picture by Alison Banwell and Doug McHale's in the back here, if you're, those of you who recognize him from this picture. Um, so this was uh, from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, essentially you have, uh, you know, these, these sort of large accumulations of surface water, Clearly, you don't have any normal snow left. This is all just down to the ice. Um, and so if most Antarctic shells are at risk of having this happen, then destabilization like we saw at Larson B could become quite common. So um, my study today will be the fern. And so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this particular side of, of, um, of cryospheric media, the fern is basically well, generally modeled as a bit of a smooth steady state process where you start at the surface and you have extremely low density, high porosity snow, and that slowly settles and you have grain growth through, you know, progressive pressure and gravitational forcing. Um, so settling in grain growth. Um, and then at certain depth, you actually lose, you, you start closing your pore space. And so that happens, you know, way down 830 kilograms per meter cube. And then it gradually turns into ice. And so this process is, is largely assumed to be smooth in most models, but if you take a non-steady state surface forcing in terms of temperature and accumulation, you can get wild swings in density as a function of, of depth. And so this sort of, you know, this, these are changes of, of you know, 50% in terms of density over the space of a few centimeters. And this is something that we've observed when you take boreholes and we dig pits is we get these ice lensing layers and then these hoarfrost layers, which are essentially just air. Um, and so there's a whole lot of variability in these fern structures that are not accounted for in these steady state models. And in terms of what those can do to seismic waves, well, fern is an extremely bizarre seismic medium. And so if you look at structures like this, for instance, these top, you know, two layers of this, um, this conceptual image here, you have an open pore space, which basically means that you have sort of this, um, this, this solid lattice of ice that holds together all this connected open pore space, which is what the snow is, essentially. And so you have an acoustic wave mode that can propagate within the, the pore space. And you also have seismic wave modes that propagate within the solid lattice. And, and sometimes these can be so low density that the acoustic mode propagates faster than the P wave mode. So you can have a, a seismic P wave that propagates at 300 meters per second, which is pretty much impossible in any other structure on earth. Uh, um, and so what this means is that this fern layer over the space of you know, 50 or 100 meters has some of the sharpest seismic gradients of any material known on earth. It's, um, it's essentially an extremely drastic basin or micro basin. And we'll see, we'll look at that through the lens of a micro basin in a bit to try to understand what seismic waves might do in a medium like this. So the real question for me and, and is, is, you know, if you're going to generate useful science is 
can we somehow use seismic methods to temporally monitor the fern? Because seismic monitors are coupled to the ground, and so they're directly sensitive, in theory, if you have the right frequencies, to um, to these sorts of structures, which are actually very hard to sample in this sort of uh, continuous real-time manner. So um, for that, there are two arrays that I will be using and talking about in this, in this talk. Uh, the first on the left is the time array. So this is a preliminary sort of nodal, seismic nodal deployment um, for shot testing. Uh, essentially, if those of you who aren't familiar with the time project, it's a Thwaites interdisciplinary margin evolution project. So it's a large multi or sort of international project, um, which is attempting to study the dynamics uh, and, and the sort of the margin constraints on um, Thwaites Glacier, which is one of the major outlet glaciers for the West Antarctic ice sheet. And so it had only 10 days of past seismic data uh, over a one kilometer array, but also crucially had um, extremely well constrained geometry. So this is a perfect one kilometer ring and shots were fired directly in the middle of this ring. And so this allowed us, this is why this is in part useful is because it's direct confirmation of any other passive readings and measurements we want to make. The second array um, is the RIS, the Ross Ice Shelf Array. And so this array basically spanned 34 broadband stations across the entire uh, Ross Ice Shelf and into the Mary Birdland over here. Um, so off shelf as well. So the last four stations are off shelf and that will be important later. Um, these three stations at the front are basically on the Calvin front. They're pretty close to and so they're most sensitive to all the whatever forcing happens from the ocean. So, um, so I'd like to briefly introduce you to what I mean um, in terms of, of seismic fern modes. And this is an initial paper that I, I published back in 2018, um, where initially I had started processing this data set with, you know, in mind, you know, with the idea to do some broad scale, you know, monitoring, maybe I'd be able to somehow use you know, ambient noise to monitor changes in the ice sheet or in the ice shelf rather, um, and in, stumbled on something entirely differently and different altogether. So um, for those who aren't familiar with spectrogram methods, this bottom left hand panel here, uh, these are basically, you take a time domain signal like a seismogram and you convert it to a time versus frequency signal. So in other words, you take each, each one of these uh, rows here is a Fourier transform of the signal and it shows you its frequency content. So this is basically 200, or uh, rather uh, two years of data and um, between frequencies of zero and 20 Hertz. And so what we noticed almost immediately was the presence of these things, these sort of very chaotic looking higher frequency resonances really. Um, so in this white box, for example, in the North component. And these, um, these peaks, sort of are unintuitive. Um, you would assume that most of the, the noise profile that, that occurs on the sheet or on the ice shelf uh, is sensitive to the entire ice shelf because you know it's not that thick. It's only two to 500 meters thick. And so um, you would expect that in any seismic waves at these frequencies that, you, that you're getting would at least have some component of sensitivity to the entire shelf. But, in, and there, there are some of those. So these vertical bars that you see there are a little fainter that don't really change with frequency. Uh, those are actually shelf modes, so plate modes in, in seismology. And so we can model those. We cannot very easily model these. And so these resonances uh, kind of sparked a bit of a, a treasure hunt because these are things that, that aren't normally observed in the ambient seismic spectrum. And they're pervasive. Each station across this entire array has its own pattern of these things. It's almost independent in some ways to the others. And so it's clearly, um, it's clearly proportional to some sort of, of site response of some kind. Uh, but at the same time, it responds dynamically on a variety of scales. So you'll notice that these things shift around in frequency content on almost a sort of yearly to seasonal cycle. And then you have these rapid increases and decreases over some other time scale. And then these like multi month slowly slow drift of these things. And so essentially it's, it's very clear that these respond dynamically to forcing on a whole variety of, of timescales. And so this was kind of a neat observation. And finally, uh, the other thing that's very interesting is that these peaks split on the horizontal. So a lot of these peaks come in doublets and on the horizontal components, one horizontal components is a slightly lower frequency than the other. And so 
they have these sort of doublet structures. And this, um, after quite a bit of head scratching, is probably indicative of anisotropy, as we'll see, as a methyl anisotropy. So here's some examples of uh, environmental responses of these peaks to um, some form of atmospheric forcing. So we have things like storm events, where you have very strong winds, for instance. Um, so these, this, black, this black time series down here on the top left is wind speed. And these are just examples of, of peaks that are tracked along the, um, the two horizontal components. And you'll notice that you know, if you have storm sequences like this, a lot of the times you'll have one storm will cause an immediate jump in one of these peaks that will then decrease on a certain you know, multi-month time scale. And so this, this lower left panel here is a zoom in of that storm event where you have three storms in a row. Um, and this is another spectrogram, of course. Um, so these three sort of strong colored signatures here are strong wind, wind events. Uh, the first one, you know, shows up, the peaks become louder for a second, then disappears. You have an increase of this one after. Um, the second storm, um, post-storm immediately causes a drift of this peak upwards by, you know, three or four hertz. And the second peak, and then the third storm does the same thing, shifts it around again. So this is, this is almost, um, so one of the only things that storms can do to the, the structure of your medium, it can't fundamentally alter the bulk velocity of your medium the only thing it can really do is alter the surface snow forms. And so we'll see that that's actually an important component in the numerical models later. The second example I'm talking about in terms of environmental forcing is this, the surface melt forcing. So there's a large, uh, a large melt event that was detected by a satellite, which I, I will show you later. Um, and uh, it was basically a, this long period of about 20 days of, of anomalously warm temperatures throughout the Ross ice shelf. And you can see that as soon as this thing strikes the spectral content of all these peaks drifts downwards and this is a, an example down here of the tracked peaks so all these peaks sort of slowly drift downwards and then hit some kind of stability and then once the colder temperatures resume then some of these stations bounce back a little but most of them actually stay pretty put so that's an interesting observation of the response of these things to the forcing so this is an aside and and this is something that i want to put in the middle of the talk, uh, because at the end of it, it would, it would have been a, a little too late to consider what these things sound like. But um, once, when I initially published this paper, I made some sonifications of these, these wailings and um, these, these sounds. And uh, it turns out that it sparked a bit of imagination among people who thought it was the end of the world, as they do most things. Uh, and so, um, so here's an example, uh, if I can actually play this. Well, I wonder if I can not play with a laser pointer. OK, hang on. I'll have to change the laser. There we go. OK, so I hope you can hear this. And I'll move it forward to a period that I thought was interesting. So um, essentially what these are are sort of, in a sense, accelerated seismog seismograms, right? And so every day, these things drift around and have different frequency content. And in some cases, you can actually hear these strange harmonic structures where peaks emerge and do various things. Um, and so this, this artist that I'm collaborating with now, Sandro Volney, who's another French Canadian, um, is attempting to do a, uh, a sort of audiovisual spatial mapping of these peaks in a room where she has 34 of these, these big water, water tables. And she's using the seismic signals that are they're sonified to generate interesting patterns along these things. So the idea is you'll be able to walk through a room, which is a distribution of these, these Ross Ice Shelf arrays. And you'll be able to get all these strange patterns depending on which stations are feeling what at what time. And so I thought it was a really, really cool idea. Uh, it's kind of a, a visual depiction of the state of mind of an ice shelf on a given day. Um, so anyway, that was a bit of an aside. Um, I'll go back to the, oh, these things decide to play again. Oops. Right. right. So um, go back to the laser pointer. OK, so essentially, um, when I say ice ghost, it's because uh, the media went, uh, well, had a bit of its frenzy moment over this. And so Stephen Colbert made a segment on this. And he coined them ice ghosts because he thought you know, they were portents of impending doom and so on. And so, um, so anyway, so this is now what they are. They are ice ghosts forever. Um, and so one of the things we noticed is that these ambient resonances, these ice ghosts, are pervasive throughout pretty much all Antarctic media. So I, I've looked at data from South Pole, from Ross Ice Shelf, from West Antarctica, from everywhere. 
everywhere that you have a fern layer, you have these ice ghosts. And so uh, this is, for example, this bottom left here is an example at waist divide from that small nodal array. And clearly you have the presence of some of these, these things. And in fact, waste divide shows a beautiful example of when this whole thing transitions post storm into an actual um, harmonics. So a sort of a drifting harmonics kind of a pattern very temporarily, but it does it for about 10 hours, um, which is something that I, I haven't really noticed at, at the, in detail at other stations, but this is a very small time scale and I wasn't really looking uh, for the Ross ice shell. So, um, so essentially, uh, we now wanted to look into the source physics of these and try to understand why these ice ghosts exist at all. And um, this array at waste divide is actually very well suited for it in some ways. So since wind forcing tends to generate surface waves um, dominantly, um, we went into this with a goal of trying to understand what the behavior of surface waves might be uh, when you have a very nicely constrained ring of seismometers like this on a very short um, spatial scale. So first things we noticed is that, yes, we indeed had resonance peaks also on this array. And if we plot all the resonance peaks of, of all those stations, um, so these are stations along the circle, and we plot them all in sequence, you'll notice that there's actually this, this two pi pattern of, of sort of different resonance features. And the ones that actually don't have or don't exactly follow that two pi pattern have harmonics, in fact, that fit almost perfectly into where that missing peak would be. So that basically this means that, or this in my mind means that, um, that you know, if you're missing this lower peak, then you're just exciting its higher harmonic for whatever reason. And so this two pi pattern was actually kind of a, a revelation and meant that these resonance peaks were in fact very, very sensitive to whatever small scale structural changes could occur on over one kilometer. And so then we tracked um, surface waves uh, from generated anthropogenically, so from, from waste divide camp, and um, just to see what the, the content of them were and what they were behaving like. And we, we sort of saw that there were multi-mode Rayleigh waves available just from this waste divide excited noise. Um, and then uh, compared a whole lot of various metrics by which we usually evaluate surface waves and site response to see if there were any correlations. And uh, indeed there were. So one of the things for those who weren't seismologists uh, you need to know is that Rayleigh waves propagate with uh, elliptical particle motion. So they're uh, one of the two forms of surface waves that exist. Uh, they are dominantly, in, so they, they, they excite in the, um, the vertical and radial planes. And in general, at lower frequencies, Rayleigh waves tend to be uh, retrograde. So the fundamental um, modes tend to be retrograde particle motions. But there are cases, particularly for, for basin structures, where um, you can switch your particle motions to prograde motions. And so um, what we're observing here, this is a, you know, across the array. So these paths are the ones that were considered because they were in line with waste divide. And so they provided um, correctly phased Rayleigh waves. Uh, and so what we'll notice is that for the southern part of the array, the Rayleigh waves, the fundamental Rayleigh waves, lowest mode detected, were indeed retrograde. And for the higher portion, they're prograde. So there's actually a, spatial, a spatially coherent switch between these two portions of the array. And if you look at the, the horizontal to vertical energy ratio of these Rayleigh waves, um, they follow the same sort of spatial pattern. So they tend to have a very high H over V for the southern portion, but a very much lower one for the northern portion. So these are two sort of independent metrics that suggest that Rayleigh waves here are undergoing some very shallow structural sensitivities that are affecting the way that they propagate. And so the interesting part is that these resonance peaks, if you plot their, their frequency content as a function of the array distribution, you'll notice that this whole upper side too has a very a cluster of sort of lower frequency content peaks. And so this is just basic qualitative correlation, right? So you have these particle motion reversals that occur at the higher portion of the array. You have H over V ratios that clearly are spatially dependent. And you also have resonance peaks that follow the same kinds of patterns. And this could all just be correlated, but it's probably more than that. So since Rayleigh waves are behaving kind of unusually at these frequencies uh, in, in fern media, it's very likely that all three phenomena are generated by the same thing. So that these, these resonances are somehow Rayleigh wave amplifications uh, generated by the fact that your fern structure is kind of a micro basin. 
It's uh, one of these extremely low velocities, high gradient structures that trap seismic waves. So, um, so it, through that lens that Fern can be uh, a micro basin, we decide to start doing some numerical modeling um, and explore essentially the impact of depth sensitivity of Rayleigh waves on um, various sort of bizarre Fern profile models that we could be cooked up. Um, so essentially for those who, who aren't familiar with this kind of stuff either, um, there are two things to consider here is that when a Rayleigh wave propagates, uh, it is not sensitive to just the surface. So it is sensitive to a whole range of depths. In fact, in theory, the depth is, is infinite. It's just, um, except that the sensitivity falls off very rapidly. So for example, at low frequencies, um, you are primarily sensitive to much deeper structures for a fundamental Rayleigh mode. As you go to higher and higher frequencies, these bright spots indicate the depth sensitivity of that wave with respect to depth. So for example, if we take a depth of, or um, let's say a frequency of 30 Hertz. So this through here, the fundamental Rayleigh mode is primarily sensitive to structures that are right at the surface, but also between 20 and 40 meters depth. Whereas the higher mode here, this is the first higher harmonic of the Rayleigh, Rayleigh wave, the first higher mode, it's not really a harmonic, but, um, is uh, sensitive primarily between things that are five and 20 meters depth. And this is true for a variety of these certain profile models. Um, so if you take a really, really severe one, for example, this middle model where you have a VP and a VS that are very low velocity and suddenly have a very strong transition around 40 meters, the fundamental Rayleigh mode depth sensitivity is something very strange. Bet at about eight Hertz, it becomes hypersensitive to the region between 10 and 30 meters. And right before and after that, it follows a smooth, you know, relatively smooth uh, distribution. So you can actually create these sort of focusing effects of certain modes at certain depths, depending on what your structure is. So for this sort of triple tiered model here, um, the fundamental mode actually creates this pattern where it's really, really sensitive to, you know, 10 meters, it goes all the way to the surface, and then it jumps back down to 10 meters, whereas the, the first higher mode isn't even sensitive to anything at all until about 15, 15 hertz, and then it's pretty much always sensitive to the surface. And so you can create all these crazy strange patterns where you have multiple different modes of Rayleigh waves that are sensitive to different things and different depths at different frequencies. And often, you know, the fundamental mode will simply hand itself off or its, its energy propagation to the first mode. And so it has certain frequency range, the fundamental mode doesn't really propagate much anymore. And so, um, so because Fern is capable of generating these kinds of extremely high gradients, um, it's completely plausible that it can be causing all these, these strange sort of you know, particle motion reversals, which, which, which is what this range indicates with these Fern models, um, to H over re ratios that vary very spatially you know, on a very small scale. Um, and so, so yeah, all, all this is very plausible. Fern profiles can be very complex and strongly heterogeneous. So, so um, with that in mind, we go back to attempting to monitor temporal variability. Uh, and this is an example for the Ross Ice Shelf because we don't have a long period of data for, for waste divide. Uh, so this essentially is a figure that I created um, actually for the artists I'm working with. And it basically represents if I, if you take for each one of those, those spectral, those spectrogram patterns, if you track the three biggest peaks, the three biggest resonance peaks, and just evaluate their, their shifts in frequency over time, you will notice that in fact, this offers, this is all stations on the wrist, the Ross Ice Shelf here. You'll notice that there are many different scales of spatial coherence of frequency content and temporal and temporal scales. So for example, you have things like this large sequence here, which is largely constrained to the Ross Ice Shelf and isn't felt by stations that are deeper into the Ross Ice Shelf. So these are basically a proxy for stations that are deeper into the Ross Ice Shelf. These are the ones that are more at the front. So these are essentially feeling some kind of seasonal frequency shift, at least in the first year, that is then rectified by all these, these little sort of jagged sort of features, which essentially represents a storm season. So a lot of these up and down sort of jigsaw sort of, or a sort of a sawtooth patterns are the onset and then passing of storms. This red box here, for instance, depicts the large melt event that we showed. So this thing right here is the large melt event. And you can show it's very pervasive throughout the entire shelf 
except is not at all felt in the Mary Bird lens. And that's something we also mapped by satellite. The melt event simply didn't extend into the Mary Bird land. So these stations didn't feel it at all. And so these sorts of patterns are very useful. It shows you essentially the scale, the, so this time and spatial scale of different forcing mechanisms on, on the Ross Ice Shelf. And so, um, for example, stations one to 10 uh, are clustered pretty closely in terms of, um, so it's basically all these stations that are down here. And so they tend to feel the same thing. So you have these really small scale storms, for example, that aren't felt anywhere else, but they all feel them together. So it gives you an idea of the various scales and, and time frames of, of different forcing mechanisms on the Ross Ice Shelf, um, which is which is kind of neat. Um, oh, this is just a video I made for the uh, the artist to show her which which cohere which stations were coherently behaving together as a function of, of days of the year. Um, it's a uh, kind of hard to tell because it's, it's uh, plays really fast. So I'll just kind of move on, but um, still kind of neat to to see on various scales how things vary together. Okay, so this is um, this is that large melt event that was mapped by Nikolai et al. in 2017. So you can see here this contour, this orange contour, is essentially the large, the, the spatial scale of this model or, or this melting event. And stations that were off on the side of the Ross Ice Shelf up here really didn't feel it, and that's essentially why. Um, so back to to trying to model this melt forcing to see if we can get some physical parameters out of it. Um, Essentially, what we do is, is we, we superimpose all the frequency content of all the stations we have. So we track all their peaks. And then uh, notice that the higher frequencies are the ones that are decreasing in response to this melt event, whereas the lower frequencies really don't. And so that sort of suggests uh, sort of a diffusive sort of process whereby heat penetrates the ice shelf to a certain depth, but after that, um, apparently doesn't get any deeper and the lower frequencies here would represent uh, different depth sensitivity. So in our numerical models, we were able to, to sort of qualitatively reproduce some of these peak patterns by using um, sort of a discrete uh, distribution of sources on the surface, uh, along with an extremely low velocity uh, fern structure. And we can say that as we propagate a velocity anomaly deeper into the fern uh, as to a depth of a couple of meters, um, initially, the, the high frequency peak varies very rapidly, um, and the low frequency peak feels nothing. So these are basically a model for this, this particular you know, spectral distribution. Uh, and you have to go quite deep before the lower peak starts responding to it. And this actually implies sort of a, a, gradual, um, a gradual diffusion into, into the fern, as, I, as I've mentioned. Um, sort of like this study, so Gilbert et al. 2014 shows here. So they actually had, a, this was in the uh, Swiss Alps, but they actually showed that if you have this thermometer um, that's in the fern layer, uh, a, a heat anomaly can propagate sort of rapidly, but then it kind of hits a cap. It kind of hits sort of a lower limit um, where you have sort of a semi steady state and it would take much, much longer time for it to actually uh, affect deeper, deeper depths in this, this snow. And this is kind of what we're seeing here. We have an initial very rapid response and then kind of a flattening. And so it's, you know, on par. I think we're, we're modeling the physics more or less correctly. Um, another space, another dynamic effect that we talked about is the storm forcing. So when storms swing through, they cause shifts in peaks that are very rapid. And so one of the only ways that I could think of that storms might change something physical about the medium is changing the surface snow form structure. So if there's deposition, uh, stripping of, of the top layers, um, Essentially, what you're doing is you're creating these structures, for example, dunes or sastrugi or other things like that. And if you're suddenly, by a deposition, creating new structures, then that should mean that your, your noise source on the surface is spatially heterogeneous. And so since you're exciting those in spatially distinct spots, um, it should change the way that your, your spectral peaks respond. And we can actually model that as well. So this is, for example, if you start with the spectral peak on top, or the spectral pattern on top, which has these two peaks on it, and you gradually increase the range increment between sources on the surface, you can shift these peaks around rather dramatically. And so, um, so that was good to see, and that we could do such a thing. Um, this is kind of a, another neat um, proof of concept of environmental response. Um, now, as a final point um, that I'd like to go over, um, and this is something I mentioned very briefly, uh, is that yes, we've, we've addressed temporal variability and environmental forcing, 
Um, but it's also apparent that these peaks are sensitive to um, sort of more static structure as well. And so this peak splitting across the horizontals, for instance, was a mystery for me for a long time. And I, I sort of explored and tinkered around with this for, for quite a while um, before getting my hands on the waste divide data, which actually offered a proof of concept. So essentially, uh, the idea is a lot of these peaks that you observed in these, these ice ghosts actually come in doublets. So it's not always obvious from the spectrogram itself, but you can bring them out in other ways by doing things like uh, eigenvalue ratios of the, of the spectrum. And so if we look at this, this uh, power spectrum here, uh, this spectrogram, and look at the particle motions of these, these frequency components, you'll notice that a lot of the times you actually have doublets that you can't always just see. Um, for example, you have switch between you know, yellow and green particle motions, which would, which would imply sort of you know, 90 degrees to zero degrees, which is almost, almost or perpendicular splitting, right? And a lot of these peaks have that sort of behavior. They have these sort of, uh, I mean, this is different, but, um, but sort of uh, blue to green or yellow to green or, or something like that. And that implies sort of perpendicular motions. And so this is why when we track these peaks on the left here, um, we see that there's generally an offset between the two components of the signal. And so as part of this, I was curious to see what the, the distribution of splitting would look like if we, if we consider this in terms of, of anisotropy. So in azimuthal anisotropy, waves simply propagate faster in one direction than another um, from an azimuthal perspective. So if these splitting on the horizontals were anisotropy, then the job that I set myself out to do here would be to go through these images one row at a time and track spectral peaks. So when you have doublets like this, um, evaluate whether or not they are within some degree of, of perpendicular uh, motions, and then paint that. So paint the splitting to a magnitude image. So if they're split by, say, 5%, then paint this image at that frequency with a magnitude of 5%. And its directions are directly recovered via particle motions. So if you take this peak and map it to this direction and this peak to this direction, then you get both what we call slow and fast for the low and high frequency uh, components of this splitting. And so you'll get these images that are progressively painted with this, you know, sampling of, of frequency peaks, where you have magnitude of anisotropy, and also theta fast direction and a theta slow direction. And so once you have all these, then essentially what you have, hopefully, is a frequency dependent version of ambient anisotropy recorded at single stations, which is something that we can't do really in seismology, because all of our methods are time domain. And so you can't reconstruct anything uh, with a single station from ambient noise in the time domain. So um, with that in mind, uh, we went back to the waste divide um, array, which provides us not only a perfectly circular one kilometer array, but also shot data. And so this is an example of a shot gather at all um, 24 stations of the array. And if you zoom into the surface wave section, you see that it has a four pi kind of oscillation. And a four pi oscillation basically means that there is azimuthal anisotropy in your signal, inherent in your, in your medium. This, this big peak, by the way, at uh, 1.5 seconds here is an air wave because the shots were uh, fired above ground. And it has a two pi pattern because there was wind that day. And so since it's an air wave, it's affected by, uh, by wind. And so it creates a two pi pattern as opposed to fast and slow axes, which causes a four pi pattern. So if we take the spectrogram of this signal, you'll notice that we have multiple Rayleigh modes that come out of here. And uh, what I opted to do to track for anisotropy is track each of these modes separately and see how they shift around between different stations. And that gives an estimate of, again, fast and slow directions and also magnitude of, of offset between different stations, so magnitude of anisotropy. So we'll notice that here we have, generally speaking, somewhere around 5% anisotropy, which seems to go up as a function of frequency for various modes, and also a fast and a slow axis, which is pretty you know, reasonably consistent. It's got some fluctuation to it, but not too, not too much. And then it simply came down to the matter of comparing both. So since we had resonance peaks, we were able to do splitting at waste. So this is the splitting analysis that I showed you. Uh, 
map that to an image um, and track, you, you know, keep only the, the best sample frequencies since we only had 10 days of data and compare those to the fast and slow axes determined via this method. And uh, what we can see essentially is for shots, uh, we have a slow direction that is this way and a fast direction that's this way. And for the peak splitting, we also have generally a distribution that shows the same thing. There's obviously more variability in this method um, for reasons that, you know, I, we're still missing bits of the physics. So, um, so there may be some explanations as to why that's more variable in the future, but for now, at least it's, it's broad average is pretty similar. So if we map these fast and slow directions to the, the point where the time gray is, uh, near this waste divide line here, um, and compare it to its GPS related motions, um, we'll notice that by and large, the fast directions are aligned with directions of flow, give or take. And so that actually kind of poses an interesting problem uh, because in ice and isotropy uh, models in general, so the conventional models that were, were put forth you know, some 40 years ago uh, by Bentley, all suggested that the, the main method for anisotropy in ice, um, or the main um, component of anisotropy in ice was actually ice crystal alignment, so C-axis alignment. And that occurred in the direction of maximum compression. So in other words, if you have constrained flow from the sides, your fast direction is actually going to be perpendicular to flow. If you have unconstrained flow, then your fast direction is actually vertical because your compression is gravitational. So in this case, we are seeing a fast direction along flow, which is very strange. And so it's in a sense, it's actually a new form of anisotropy, which because people don't really study seismic signals in fern. And so fern is a plastically deforming substance, essentially. It doesn't, it doesn't fail brittily the way that ice does, or at least not, as, not, at, uh, not at these strain rates, for example, that the Ross ice shelf has. And so it accommodates strain plastically, which basically means that since it's a very porous and constantly accumulating and, and um, densifying medium, it accommodates that, that strain um, as stretching. So it stretches its pore space directionally uh, along flow. So if you're sensitive to very high frequencies, or if, you're, if you're, you're sensitive to very shallow media with high frequencies, then the fast direction will basically occur along flow because you are changing the tortuosity of that porous medium. So the only proxies that I could find uh, in terms of, of studies like this are actually acoustical studies of directionally growing foams that people um, study in order to, to, to think about uh, things like sound muffling and um, uh, attenuation. But so there are only a few studies out there which have done ultrasonics and, and acoustics in directionally growing foams. And so that's the only proxy we really have for snow because we don't, we don't study this. <laughs> this is a new thing. Uh, and so essentially for the Ross ice shelf, if we want to also do that, that study of, of peak splitting, and we take only the dense part of the array because it's, um, it's, it's more easy to compare on, on, on terms of um, station coherence. Um, and we map these to two frequencies. So you have this, this high frequencies in this black bar and the sort of lower frequency range in the red bar. You'll notice that most of these black bars are aligned forward. And that's because they're sensitive to the flow direction. But the red bars tend to be sensitive to larger scale structures. For example, RS3, its fast direction is this way. And it's because you have these large rifts that propagate you know, relatively close to it. Um, RS-16 has a mapped invected fracture here, a crevasse, so its fast direction is that way. Um, DR-14, for example, more rifts. Um, and so it's a little more complicated at lower frequencies because you can't always distinguish what extremely local structure is affecting these, these lower frequency sensitivities. But at the same time, it maps pretty well to what we expect, uh, all in all, from, uh, from satellite mapped um, strain provinces like, like this image. So um, as a summary of this, it's been rather dense. So this is you know, three, three papers worth of stuff um, that we're still just developing. And so the main advances here is that we have these, these high frequency ambient signals that are pervasive throughout all of Antarctica and probably beyond. I bet we could find some of these in other, other snow and fur media throughout the world. Um, and they're broadly sensitive to environmental forcing, but very subtle environmental forcing. Um, as well as longer time scales. Uh, so I bet, I bet some of these are, are actually um, sensitive to fern compaction processes, as we saw and we've seen the multi sort of month uh, scales. 
So there's a variety of correlated responses um, to these, these atmospheric forcings uh, that are likely due to Rayleigh and potentially love wave um, amplifications from microbasin structures. So because the gradient of the fern is so severe uh, and its velocities are so low at the surface, uh, all sorts of wave trapping phenomena are possible. Uh, so peak splitting finally um, reveals also in anisotropic structures at single stations using ambient noise, which is something that we cannot do with other seismic methods. And generally, we either need a known source that produces us time domain splits of S waves, um, or we do cross correlations and recover Rayleigh and Loveways that way and try to do anisotropy between stations. But we don't have another method, as far as I know, that does um, any kind of um, single station on isotropy like this, especially not in the spectral domain. So as for current questions and future work, um, there is still sort of a physics problem. Since we're in the near field, it's very hard to isolate exactly what waves are doing this. So one of the proposed things that, that, I'll, that I'm writing a grant about or proposal about right now is to go back out to the Ross Ice Shelf or, or anywhere else that will take us really, because it doesn't really matter where we are, and deploy an ultra dense array of seismometers, but also a borehole uh, of seismometers with rotational instruments. And so rotational seismometers can distinguish between wave types. And that's kind of an important thing if we want to constrain exactly what sort of uh, mechanisms physically are happening here. Um, and um, finally, since these things, uh, these, these resonances are so strongly correlated with structures, um, or, or not with structures, but with environmental forcing, it stands to reason that maybe we can do machine learning on this. So we have a few methods that we've been mulling over, uh, sort of exploring um, convolutional neural nets with a deep learning component to sort of try classifying these structures, um, these, these peak structures, uh, based on their variability. So if you have a broad array of stations and you just set them out somewhere and they record a lot of these resonances, um, in theory, you should be able to train a system that recognizes what sort of environmental forcing patterns are at work when you see certain patterns do what. And so this is kind of an interesting prospect for me um, because I think it's, uh, it's one of the only methods that I can really think of that in which we can gather sort of direct structural, um, structural sensitivity to, to very shallow layers um, and a very delicate medium. So um, with that, I will uh, leave this slide uh, up for next talk which uh, is with large scale avalanche mapping. So it should be really fun. And I'll take any questions that come my way. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Um, are there questions for Julian? You can pop uh, something onto the chat just to say you've got a question uh, and I might mute yourself. Um, This was a lot of seismology. Uh, Any questions at all? Um, did you have, have you got one Peter or are you just uh, uh, switching your camera on there and therefore popping to the top of the uh, zoom pile. You're muted at the moment if you're perfect. Oh. Ooh. Uh, you might have turned into a uh, fern ghost there, actually, Peter. Might have to put that on the chat or, or try again. Uh, You've turned into a robot. You might have to type that question out. Uh, yeah, that's sounding awfully like your fern ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to try risk <laughs> risk switching? Ah, there there? Oh, there we go. Uh, one from Linnea there on the uh, okay. on the chat. Uh, through the idea of using CNNs to classify events, yeah. What sort of data do I think I would need or to feed into the CNNs and how can I give a description of how that might work? Okay, so that's a really good question. And that's um, part of the broad field. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, hi there. Okay.
Uh, <sighs> you do you want to go ahead while you're actually got sound, uh, Peter, yeah. and then we'll get back to Linnea's uh, question afterwards. That, that sounds good, yeah. Oh, Peter, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Yes. Can you hear me now? Y yes. <laughs> um, can you hear me? I, I yes. think, Peter, you can't hear us, but we can hear we you. Can. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think you have us muted or something. Yeah. <laughs> we hear you, so very, very clearly. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've just muted you, Peter. Um, when you can hear us again, give us a wave, and uh, yes. answer. Oh dear. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm gonna. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna answer. Um, Peter, uh -oh. can you hear us? I don't think you can. No, okay, I'm going to mute him though. That, that seems fine. Um, okay, well, I'll answer Linnea's, Linnea's questions first. So yes, so the idea with these sorts of, of systems is that you, you have two potential approaches you can follow. So the first is that you can either decide what your, your features will be. So in other words, these, um, these things here. So a lot of the time what you do is filters Good Lord, he's unmutable. Um, okay, you'll, you'll see features um, that are chosen, such as, for example, filters of various kinds, and you'll essentially you know, train your neural network based on those features and use those in order to sort uh, different signals. The alternative um, is to let the signal itself decide what the features should be. So for example, oh, if I you... <laughs> God. <laughs> So the, uh, the features themselves can be trained directly from environmental forces. So for okay. Uh, I saw just muting him until um, uh, it seems a bit better. I'm going to message him directly. Yeah. Um, so essentially, you could let, for example, a storm like, like this event over here uh, dictate what the features could be. And one way to do that is there, there are many feature extraction algorithms out there. So one way to do it, this, what we're proposing is what's called a non-negative non matrix factorization. And so that's because these are power spectra, you can do this um, because the, the inherent optimization is, is non-negative. Um, but there are many other ways to extract features from, yeah. um, from a given image. It seems to be saying each. <laughs> I think he's unmuting himself. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, and so uh, what we can do afterwards is once you have those features extracted from various uh, examples of the things you're looking for, you can train it. Alternately, there are significant advances in deep learning nowadays where um, you don't actually decide what sort of features you feed your neural net. What you do is you add that as a parameter of your optimization of your, of your neural network tuning. And so you simply feed it the images and tell it, you know, try to find some kind of, I don't know, clustering discrimination between different classes of behaviors. And oftentimes it will find interesting patterns that you didn't even know existed. And so that's uh, you know, what they're using in, um, in um, for example, not, or natural language processing. So I'm doing some work uh, on that with um, Pacific Northwest National Lab. And so their, their algorithms are actually kind of applicable directly. Uh, I hope that answers your question, but we can certainly talk more if, if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, second question was, what happens, might happen, with peak splitting at melting events? And that is an excellent question. And to be perfectly honest, I have no idea, because uh, I haven't looked into that yet. But would um, anisotropy change if you started melting things? And that, uh, that's a good question, honestly. And I think the, the intuitive answer to that is how much you're melting. So if you are melting um, so much that you destroy the pore structure, then I suspect the resonance peaks would dis disappear altogether. And that's sort of one of the, we had hints of that during a melting event where the entire frequency content quieted and lowered. And so I think if you lose your fern layer, you don't get resonance peaks. Um, as you approach the melting point, though, you have a significant drop in bulk modulus in, in these systems. And so um, I think what happens is that 
these actually serve if you if you're approaching melting you'll you'll notice a drifting downwards and i think if the peaks disappear altogether then you know you've had melt or at least significant melt and so in some ways it's it could be a way to monitor for these these things but it's a good idea it's a good question about what happens to anisotropy because i don't actually know um, uh, I'm afraid I've kind of lost um, which questions you've answered, so perhaps you oh, could have I've, a look I've answered, I've answered the first I was, Yes, I've answered the first two in the chat. Uh, brilliant. So I was, in, in, I was on mute alert. <laughs> well, that, that's fine. I'm just scrolling my way through them and answering them as I go. Um, uh, have you had a closer look at how these resonance patterns of fern compare to, say, surface sediments? where we expect a similar transitional rate, yes. Well, that's, yes, this is actually, um, so we have a paper in review right now, uh, which um, sort of, which is why, in part, why we treat these ferns like micro basin structures. They're, um, so very shallow sediments um, can indeed offer extreme velocity variations like this. I, the difference is it's not the same kind of porosity structure. And so I don't think the velocities are quite as low. I mean, in fern, you can have P wave velocities of under 300 meters per second. If you have that in sediments, um, I, I assume it would have to be very sort of almost, I wonder if, I wonder what the seismic velocity is in sand, but I would have to, I would have to check it out. Um, but the interesting thing about what you're asking here is that we actually have an experiment out in the desert right now with the Army Research Lab um, in the Hornada Desert, uh, right outside of uh, El Paso, it's about an hour away, where we're actually trying to study what happens um, with environmental forcing in the desert climates as well, because these sorts of, of systems are intuitively kind of similar in some ways. Um, we just, however, started, so I don't have the answer to your question yet, but I would expect um, that areas where you have these extremely shallow, sharp transitions in, in velocity structures like this to potentially also show resonance peaks. It's just that people haven't classically looked for them because high frequency seismology is in its infancy. We're really just uh, scratching the surface of all this. So, um, Roger Clark had a question. Uh, you can offer values about seismic on Sansilis. Oh, great. Well, we should talk then. Yeah. Uh, we, yes. <laughs> we'll we'll have a because uh, my my desert project would, would probably benefit from a from a chat. Um, sure. Well, hello, Julian. Thanks for the thanks for the fascinating talk. So, apologies, I had to miss quite a lot of the middle of it due to uh, domestic domestic duties. Um, but the the comment I was going to make, yes, was about low P wave speeds. There's an awful lot been done on sand and soils by the engineering community that I've had to get quite familiar with. And, and P wave speeds down in two figures of meters a second oh, are, are wow. quite standard. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if if somebody presses me and says, uh, "What's the what's the P wave speed in the soil layer somewhere in the UK?" the answer is 100 to 150 meters a second. Um, mm -hmm. But what I, what I was really interested in was whether or not you've you've any sense of any velocity inversions going on. In, in any of the models that you've produced from anywhere, because when you've got these ice lenses, they're quite thin, but yeah. when you do this back as averaging process to, to quote, see what a 10 Hertz or five Hertz seismic wave would see, they'd see some kind of smooth version of those spiky yeah. density and therefore velocity depth profiles that often have velocity inversions in them. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's an excellent question. And, and honestly, um, it's not an easy one to resolve. Like we, so what you're, what you may be thinking about is we did um, some inversions with, uh, sorry, this is like these sorts of things, for example. Um, and so the way we did this initially um, is that I just, I, I figured, well, if these are phenomenologies that can be captured by sort of layered processes, so from two, two dimensional layered processes, um, and I figured I would see if it was even possible to generate spectral amplifications using a distribution of surface sources, um, sort of in the relative near field, and sort of some, some kind of arrangement of an extremely low velocity fern profile with a high gradient. And you can, of course, um, because you know, this is an example of it. But what exactly, um, so in terms of an inversion, can you, can you solve for structure? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. And that's a big maybe because I don't know how unique um, these, these sorts of, of patterns are with respect to fern structure. So 
Can I replicate them? Yes. I mean, this was done with the Bayesian, you know, MCMC kind of deal, which we just searched over a whole load of parameters just to see if it was possible. But how unique su such a profile would be in terms of an inverse sort of a profile is, is, you know, that's much more difficult because I don't know the exact physics of what's causing these resonances in the first place, since everything is in the near field. So um, would I, would, what would be really nice is if we actually had a project and that would, would go back, for example, and get a very accurate um, sort of a core profile of the velocity and that, you know, that would be all ultrasonically tested and we could just plug that into, into a numerical you know, you know, algorithm and just see how well we can replicate anything, if anything. Um, yeah. And if we replicate nothing, then clearly there are others, there are other factors at play that we didn't know about. So it's part of the, part of the reason that, you know, I'm pretty keen to go back and, and do something like, like this thing here where we map all the surface structures um, and have sort of a multi-instrumental, you know, both weather and, and uh, rotational instruments with depth kind of deal, just to see how much, how much sorting we can do of the different wave types that are involved in the system. Um, so yes, as a seismologist is an extremely frustrating problem um, because it's also a very difficult one. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I think another option would be to go out there and do a bit of active source surveys and combine that with, you know, coring and, and anything else we can get our hands on. This is, would very much be sort of a high resolution multi data set problem to solve, I think. Um, but yes. Okay. Thanks very much. We can be in touch offline about uh, soils yeah. and seismic here. Yeah, yeah I'd, love, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Um, let's see what else was there. Uh, There's one from Ian Kelly. I don't know whether, Ian, you want to unmute yourself? Uh, Ian Kelly, yeah. uh, a closer look at the resonance patterns, serve sort of sediments. Oh, uh, that was more or less the same ones I think that we just uh, we just talked about. Uh, because this was a, uh, that was surface out. Yeah, we, we talked briefly about that. Oh, there's another one. Um, do you think that the resonance have had an unpredicted effect on the more studied reverberations channeled with an ice sheet layer? Ah, so you're talking about actual waveguide modes. Um, so the thing with the, um, I think, I'm not sure exactly. I, I, so the Ananda Krishnan and Wismary papers, is that the receiver function ones with the, uh, the reverberations of the P wave? Sorry, I don't know if the, I don't know if Ian is still, I guess. Yeah, uh, essentially, um, I think you may be referring to waveguiding, like full uh, ice shelf waveguiding modes. And this is a little bit different to that because we have those inherent in the spectrogram. So um, I think I have some examples early on of some of those waveguided modes, uh, for instance, yeah, here. So you see these vertical bars here, those are actually, modelable modes. So for example, those, those don't change as a function of time, just, just their amplitude changes based on excitation strength. Uh, but several of these modes, uh, for example, you know, the, the love wave for the entire shelf, uh, what we call leaky P, which is actually a, a resonant wave that's trapped beneath the ice shelf in the water and then leaks into the surface. So that one's pretty well modelable. Then you have Crary and Love 2, and these are all well-known plate modes that you can just plug in the physics and you're like, oh yeah, that fits the, that fits your, your, fit, your, um, your thickness and profile very well. So the thing, the only things that we really couldn't figure out were these things that vary far too much to be sensitive to the entire shelf, because if this was actually sensitive to the whole shelf, we would probably be in trouble uh, because the variations of frequency are on the order of, you know, sometimes 50%. So when you have something that's sensitive to the whole shelf and you have a 50% variation in physical parameters, your ice shelf is probably gone. Um, so it's both good that this isn't sensitive to the whole shelf, but unfortunately it doesn't allow a full monitoring of the shelf. It just allows for the very, very, very topmost layers. And I have some more numerical modeling results that you know, show that yes, you do have these extreme sensitivities to shallow structures when you have these high gradients. So um, I hope that answered your, your question there. Does that answer your question, Ian? Uh, is it, if Ian's still there? Might um, not be. Yeah, might not be. That's fine. Uh, uh, Peter, do you want to go oh, ahead and try we, your question? Do we finally have Peter? Wait a minute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so I, I noticed that uh, uh, you mentioned storm forcing for excitation of these resonance modes, and. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's not really clear what 
what the forcing is. And I was just wondering if you looked at whether fluctual gravity waves could actually excite them. Because I remember uh, looking at uh, Doug McGale's uh, uh, data from the uh, Nesson iceberg back in 212. And it seemed to me that those resonance modes, which were quite clearly visible there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, died off considerably during the winter months, suggesting that, you know, there might be something to do with the gravity wave forcing at the front. Uh, yeah, so I think um, so. I think what you're talking about here is um, so when you have the open pollinia versus closed closed pollinia sort of moments. So the um, well, no, mainly when when the when the sea ice uh, you know gets really dense and, and damps out most of the gravity wave forcing, then there's no flexural you know, the flexural wave energy dies down considerably as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's. I mean, I think some of these. Um, so I think for the most part, yeah. So. When you have um, so when the sea ice is is um, what is there, in fact, these things are more prominent. So when you have damping of all these these um, this ocean excitation, so these this red uh, square here, for example, in this the figure here, um, is when the pollinia is actually open. So there's no sea ice. So it's actually more forcing. Uh, whoops. Um, and so essentially, the resonance peaks don't really seem to care either way. Open pollinia, closed pollinia doesn't really matter. Um, and so they, I mean, the fact that they're, they're broadly excited all the time, uh, and the fact that they're also excited in other media that have nothing to do with that, not near oceans at all, for example, waste divide or South pole, mm -hmm. um, they're everywhere. So these things are in every station that I've ever looked at, uh, in, in fern media. And so, um, the excitation process at these frequencies, uh, pretty much has to be wind somehow, um, because there's really nothing else. Um, there's nothing transient about them. They're just always there. Um, and clearly, clearly, they're very strongly correlated with wind speed as well. That's something that uh, I haven't shown here. But if you, if you just track wind speed, the amplitudes of these things come and go directly proportionally to, to wind speed. So, um, so yeah, I mean, w could you excite them with, uh, with gravity waves? Probably, if you're in the right frequency content. I think they they probably just respond to about any kind of influx of energy you have, but I think dominantly they're, they're forced by wind. Um, but that's, yeah, that's my, my conclusion so far. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, ah, are you, I guess there's a question from, uh, oh, I see, I see. Oh, it's linear. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd be happy to chat, um, linear if you want to, uh, if you want to chat more about you know what I'm mulling over for these these learning these learning algorithms, um, we don't have anything you know I haven't this is more of a proposal uh, that I'm thinking about and I've got some work I'm doing with PNNL um, on unrelated learning problems but they're all transposable and I think soon enough this whole concept of, of supervised machine learning will actually kind of taper off I think ultimately it's it's much more you get better results when you let your data just just do the speaking and tell you where the, the, the partitioning in your your behaviors is so um, so yeah I'd be happy to chat if you want to send me an email I think that's the end of the questions and that's the end I think that's the end of the questions yeah yeah um, so thank you very much for uh, telling us all about your singing snow and um, I think you ought to uh, show us all the artwork uh, when it's uh, yeah. more developed. Yeah, well, if you want to, if you if you'd like to look up her name, she she does a lot of this stuff. So she, her name is Sandra Volney, and she's uh, she's really she's actually going to be spending. Um, so we're inviting her over for a, sort of a collaborator, so multi-week collaborator stay in the, in the fall. So she'll be giving a seminar at UTEP, and on top of that, um, she's just going to join me in the desert and deploy some microphones, uh, to see what what gives, as it were. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a neat adventure that we're on, I think. Fantastic. And uh, encourage everyone to come back next week for a uh, yes. talk by Elizabeth uh, Hafner and Eve Buhler on yep. large-scale avalanche mapping uh, using satellites and photogrammetric uh, snow depth mapping. So um, thanks very much to the audience. Thank you again to Julian. And uh, see you next week. Yeah, thank you all for joining. Thanks for the questions. I'll see you next week. Julian, would you like the a copy of the text chat just uh, so you can see? Yeah, sure. Oh. Yeah, sure. If you if you have it, if you can just. Yeah. I could I'll also send. just I could also just copy it into a text file or something. Um, I can send it to you by email. It's not no problem. Great.
Great, thanks, appreciate it. Okay, thank you again. See you all next week. Next week.